Welcome back to another video in this series about design patterns for object-oriented languages. In this video, we are going to talk about the null object pattern. So just a quick reminder, the keyword null or the value null is what we use to represent nothingness. As in, let's say that we declare that we have a string called name and if we don't say equals foo, for example, well, if we do say equals foo, for example, then, then the value that the name refers to or the string that is contained within the word name, within the variable name here, is foo. But if we didn't do this, if we simply just declared the existence of the variable, this would then in many languages mean that name equals equals null. In other words, is null. And just as a reminder again, there are in other languages we have, for example, the keyword nil, which so in Ruby, for example, and that is effectively the same thing as null. So the notion of null is the notion of not having a value, the, the notion of nothingness. As an interesting side note, if you're not already familiar with that, the inventor of the idea of null is Tony Hoare, a super famous computer scientist. And he, he has apparently apologized for inventing the null and has called it his billion dollar mistake. So essentially, the point is that null is tricky. N nothingness is tricky because whenever we have something which is nullable, like, like let's say a string is nullable, meaning it can either be the value of the thing that we put inside the string, it can either be a string or it can be null. So it can either not be a string or it can be a string, which is not the same thing as saying that it's a string, which is why, for example, some languages separate the notion of an int from a nullable int. So if you say that it's an int, it's definitely, definitely a number. You can't have null. But if it's a nullable int, it's either null or it's an int. But if you haven't been thinking about why null would be dangerous before, you might now be thinking, but why would it be dangerous to use null? Null is super powerful because sometimes I want to uh, specify that something is nothing. Or sometimes you want to have a special value that you want to be able to check for so that uh, you can terminate a loop or whatever it is you're doing. But essentially, the key problem here lies in the fact that we said or before. So whenever we introduce nulls, we either have a thing or we don't, which means that there are necessarily two branches through the program if we are supposed to do anything useful with the contents of that variable. So if something can be null, that means there is one path through the program where we do something with it if it's not null, and there's another path where we do something else if it is null. Presumably, because I mean, maybe in some scenarios you would treat them exactly the same, but null doesn't do a whole lot, so you can't like add to null, for example. But then again, specifically what you can do with a null depends a lot on which language you're in. So maybe in some languages you can actually concatenate with null because null would then probably be the same thing as empty string. But either way, the problem is conditionals. The problem is branching. The problem is that as soon as something is nullable, we have to check whether it's null or not. And you're probably painfully familiar with this. Just think about every time you're writing a method and then you accept an argument and that argument is potentially nullable and then you realize, oh my God, what if somebody sends null through this parameter? Okay, and then you start off your method with just checking whether every value is null or not and then doing different things depending on whether it is or whether it's not. But enter the null object pattern. Why do we need a thing such as the null object pattern? Well, it addresses exactly this problem. So in object-oriented programming, I would say that one of the key things that we do is that we replace conditionals with polymorphism. One of the major reasons for why we use objects is that we use objects because it gives us polymorphism. It allows us to say that I have this thing which is of some general type but I'm not sure exactly what, what specific concrete type it is of. But, but if you treat it as something of this parent type, then you can dispatch method calls, you can send messages to it and be sure that it somehow will respond because if it is of this parent type or behaves as this parent type, it necessarily needs to respond to those methods. So if we say that we have 
an animal class that is then inherited by or implemented by, let's say that this is an interface, and we have two implementers of this interface, one which is called cat and one which is called dog. And if the animal class, or sorry, if the animal interface specifies that the notion of being an animal or the notion of having animalness entails having a speak method. <laughs> that means that we can count on cats having a speak method and dogs having a speak method. This is the whole point of, of object-oriented programming, th this polymorphism. And this of course means then that we can d design a method, let's say, that returns a string and it's called speak and takes something of type animal, let me call it A, and then I'll open up this method. And what we do is that we maybe return a dot speak and we concatenate that with an exclamation point. I mean it's a totally useless method. My, my point is just that if we accept something of type animal rather than of type cat or of type dog, that means that of course we can we can send cats to this method and it works fine and we can send dogs to this method and it works fine as long as the interface specifies that animals need a speak method. Now <laughs> This you are probably intimately familiar with, so why am I saying this? Well, the point is this. If you think about what's happening here, what's happening is that we are replacing some kind of conditional with polymorphism. So instead of saying, instead of in this method, accepting this animal and keeping maybe a, a constant in the animal, so let's say we didn't have the cat subclass and we didn't have the dog subclass, maybe we just have animal and then we have some kind of enum or, or a constant or some, some, some string inside of here that specifies whether it is a cat or a dog. And then here in the speak method, we would say, well, okay, if type, equals cat, then meow, and if else if type equals dog, then woof, and so forth. The whole point of having polymorphism is that we can avoid that. We replace this conditional with polymorphism. And the super genius thing is that we can do the same thing when we have nulls. So what we can do is that we could say, well, actually, there might be cats, there might be dogs. Let me actually draw it here instead. And there may be no animals. So cat implements the interface animal, dog implements the interface animal, and no animal implements the interface animal. And this sounds completely bonkers, but that's because our scenario is completely hypothetical, so we need to look at something a bit more concrete. But the point is then that we would then supply an implementation within no animal for all of the methods that are required by the interface that it that it implements. So if it implements the interface animal, then a no animal will implement all of these methods, but it will simply do quotation marks nothing. So in some sense, yes, in some sense, this is just old, normal old inheritance, normal old interface implementation, n just normal polymorphism. But I think it's very useful to have this word, null object pattern, because it reminds us that whenever we see a null, there's a high likelihood that we can replace that null with a null object. There's a high chance that we can say, okay, wait, now I'm talking about, let's say, an iterator or a strategy, or let's say a flying strategy. I think we actually talked about this a bit in the strategy pattern video, in the first video in this series. So if you have a flying strategy or a flying behavior as a sort of parent class or as an interface, and then you have multiple implementers of that interface, so flying with jet rockets or flying with wings, then it's completely logical, it's completely sensible to also have a no flying behavior. You could say that maybe some set of different things in my application can be endowed with a flying behavior, but some of them will be endowed with a no flying behavior, even if just temporarily. So, so let's talk about a few examples. Let, let's start in this end. Let me just remove all of this stuff. So let's say that we are building a game. First example, let's say that we've got this side scroller of this dude running super fast and then there are sort of obstacles on the way and then we can move in in these different directions. So we can move left and we, we can move right and we can move down and we can maybe jump. So down would maybe then be to crouch. So let's say these are connected, these different arrows or these different directions, these are, are hooked up to the arrow keys. 
let's say. So whenever we press the up arrow key, the player jumps. And whenever we press the right arrow key, the player moves right. And then left and then down and then so forth. So here's the thing. There are multiple different ways we could think about this, but maybe we could think about it this way. Maybe this is a moving behavior. Moving behavior, moving behavior. And this moving behavior essentially then is a class that implements some interface which is more general. But if we only think about the concrete class, maybe it then has a few public methods that are called, for example, on the right, on the left, on jump and on crouch and so forth. Or let's say actually on up and on down. And then we have implementations for these. So actually, let's call this, let's make this the interface. So I said this was the concrete class, but let's say that this is an interface. So there's an interface called moving behavior. We open it up and these are the things that we need. And these are all, let's say, void methods, void, 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 and void, and they take no arguments. And then that's the interface, that's it, right? And then we can have concretions of this. One of them would, for example, then be normal moving behavior. So maybe the moving behavior for on right changes the coordinates of the player slightly to the right. And on left changes the coordinates of the player slightly to the left. And then on up supplies force to the player so that it jumps and then is pulled down by gravity, for example. But what if then, imagine that you have like power-ups in this, you have power-ups in this game and then some of the power-ups are good and some of the power-ups are bad. And then the player touches one of these power-ups and it turns out that it's a bad power-up. And that maybe forces the player to freeze or makes the player freeze. So in other words, suddenly we can't use the arrow key. So whatever, the, whatever position the player was in, Maybe it freezes and, and the world just keeps on scrolling, but the player is freezed in that position. So that would maybe be a no moving behavior, right? And suddenly you can start to see, wait, actually, there are a lot of places where we could use this. And sorry, of course, now I called it a no moving behavior instead of a null moving behavior, but you can see the parallel, null, no, and, and, here it, and here the no makes sense because we're essentially saying you can't move, the player can't move. And I'm not sure entirely what the null would be in this scenario. It's possible that if we tried to build some other solution, we would end up with a null, but, it was not, but it's not apparent to me where the null would reside if we didn't use this no moving behavior uh, solution or using this sort of no moving behavior strategy that we put inside the player. Or depending on how you think about it, if you watch the video on state pattern, you could think of this as a no moving state. And then we could have a normal moving state or a powered up moving state. So the player can be in either of these states and on right, on left, on up, on down has different implementations depending on which of these states we are in. But crucially, what we're talking about now is that it's completely allowed, it's completely sensible in many scenarios to have a no state a state that says, well, this state actually does nothing because we want to avoid to do this null checking. So we want to be able to inject something that behaves just as all of the other things behave, but that simply does nothing or does sort of the default thing. Let's talk about a different example where the null is more obvious. I just realized that the null that we would probably check for in the example that we just talked about is probably the existence or lack of existence. In other words, the absence of a moving behavior. So we would probably say, if you have a moving behavior, execute methods on the moving behavior, else don't move. So we would remove the moving behavior. But then again, I mean, it's kind of contrived because if, if we realize that we can use moving behaviors then we would probably realize that we can also implement the no moving behavior. But here's a less trivial example. If you're new to this series, let me just mention that what we do in this series is that we talk about design patterns. And I tend to recommend two great books. This one, which is called Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software, and this one, which is called Head First Design Patterns. Now, this is a more sort of pedagogical book, super good if you are new to design patterns, and this is the classic book that sort of put design patterns for object-oriented software on the map or for programming on the map. Either way, both of these books are great, so if you get both of them or one of them, I'm sure you won't regret your decision. Anyway, let's move on. The reason I show these now is that none of these books actually mention the null object pattern as a full-fledged pattern of its own. In their chapters, they talk about different patterns. However, this book, Design Patterns, it does mention something called a null iterator. And essentially, it's exactly the same idea as the null object pattern, but it's not applied widely. It's just in the context of an iterator. Head First Design Patterns builds on this idea and also talks about the null, null iterator, but also talks 
talks about a null command used in command pattern and also mentions that some people actually consider this a full-fledged design pattern. I don't really see any reason why we should not consider the null object pattern a fully fledged design pattern, so let's consider it. Anyways, let's talk about the example of having a null iterator. So if you watch the video on iterator pattern, you know that what the iterator pattern allows us to do is that it allows us to extract an iterator from an aggregate, from an iterable, so that we can iterate over the structure using the iterator. So we have an iterable, let me call it collection, and then let's say that we get that from somewhere, so we have some kind of collection. And then we can say iterator, let me call it lowercase iterator, equals collection dot get iterator. So that gets us an iterator specific for that collection that we can then use to iterate through this collection. And the reason we might want to have a null iterator is that, consider this, consider that you have a tree structure. So now, so now think about the composite pattern, if you watch the composite pattern video. So, so now we're really going all over the place with all of the different patterns. But this also goes to show that null objects are extremely useful in many, many different scenarios. But if you have a, a composite using, for example, the composite pattern, so you have this kind of tree structure, then you know that the leaves, the ones in the bottom, let me change color, the leaves here in the bottom, they are fundamentally different from these other ones, these nodes, these branches or composite nodes, because these red ones, these non-leaves, these, they all have children. So this, this node has two children, 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 and so forth. However, these green nodes in the bottom, they are leaves, so they don't have any children. So the reason I'm bringing up both of these at the same time is that if you have a composite, you can use iterator pattern to iterate through the composite. We didn't really talk about this, and, and I'm not gonna dig into it in depth, but just try to think about it intuitively. Anything can return an iterator. If anything that is iterable can return an iterator. So let's say that we don't just say that all of these things are components. Think about the composite pattern. We said that the red ones are composites and the green ones are leaves. But both composites and leaves are components and that's how we can treat them uniformly or treat them as if they were the same. But let's say that both of these don't just implement the interface component, they also implement the interface iterable. So we can ask any of these, we can say, okay, this node dot get iterator. So using recursion, using this composite structure, we can ask the, the outermost node, the root node, we can ask that for its iterator. And it will somehow ask this for its iterator and this for its iterator, and they will in turn ask their children for their iterators, and they will in turn ask their children for their iterators when they are iterating over, uh, when we are iterating over this structure. So if you think about it, what will happen when we ask this root composite for its iterator? Well, it will return an iterator that is a composite iterator. Presumably, these green ones, the leaves, would return a leaf iterator, but we'll get to that. So the composite here, the root composite, because it's a composite, would return a composite iterator. And a composite iterator is not super trivial because what it needs to do is that it can't just ask this composite for its left child and its right child, or essentially all of its children. What it has to do is that it has to dig downwards. So it has to, yes, ask for its left child, but then if we're going in this particular order, right, as we talked about before, there are multiple orders of traversing a tree or multiple ways of traversing a tree. But if we go in this particular order, it has to, yes, return its, uh, let's say, left child or first child here, but then also ask for the iterator for, for that component. So it has to ask that component for, for its iterator by calling get iterator. And then if we dig down in the same direction, what that iterator has to do, what that iterator that now traverses this composite, so you can sort of view it as, as that this composite node now is the root node, so we're starting from here, and then it has to do the same thing, this iterator. So it has to say, well, okay, I'll first give you reference to my left child, but then I'll also initiate my iterator, or uh, sorry, not my iterator, the, the iterator of this composite will initiate the iterator for this, uh, this child. So we will call get iterator on that, 
and then that iterator will do the same thing. So again, it's as if we were starting from here. So we have an iterator that's traversing this structure essentially only, as if this was the root. And then that would simply return these two children. But if we wanted that kind of logic, where it only returns these two children, then we somehow need to have an if. Somewhere we need to have an if that says, if what I'm referencing is a composite, in other words, this iterator that, that starts from this composite, when it looks at this node and it looks at this node, it has to say, is that node a composite? If so, then return its iterator. If not, then uh, simply do nothing but continue, to, but continue to the next. Because when we're down here, we have to return something. If we've called get iterator on this thing, if we've called get iterator here, then that thing needs to respond with some kind of iterator. And then, ta-da, is, is where we get the no iterator. Or maybe, sorry, maybe this we should call a null iterator. And this null iterator, the only thing that does is that if, if you think back to the iterator pattern video, we had methods such as has next or is done that determine whether the iteration should continue or not. Well, the null iterator simply always returns false to, to, if the question is has next, or always returns true if the question is is done, because we have nothing to return, because this is not the composite structure. So this value has already been returned by this iterator one level above. It has already been returned by this composite iterator. So this, since it is not a composite, simply doesn't have to return anything. So the, the iterator responds with, well, I don't have anything to iterate over, I am done, or I have no next element. And this is kind of ingenious, because if you think about it, when we used composite pattern, we avoided if statements, we avoided switching, we avoided branching by simply saying that a composite is fundamentally different from a leaf but we say that both are components, which means that we can treat them uniformly. So in some sense, from the outside, we don't know whether we have a composite or whether we have a leaf, but whenever we happen to call a method upon a composite or a leaf, because of polymorphism, we are able to do different things without having to introduce an if statement, which is really powerful, which then means that when we call get iterator, when, we, when these things implement a get iterator method, you can think of that as a factory method, then these can produce different iterators. Both the, let's say we didn't write that, but let's say that we have a, let's call it the, the null iterator. But let's say that we have a composite iterator and a null iterator. So the null iterator would be returned by leaves and the composite iterator would be returned by composite. And suddenly our iterators don't need if statements either because they are using polymorphism. So that's one, another example of how we can use the null object pattern. Let's look at one final example. Let me remove this stuff. And this example is from the command pattern. So think back to the command pattern video. If you don't really remember, the command pattern is a way of loading, metaphorically, loading buttons with commands. So let's say that we have this dialog box with an X button here, some kind of button here, and some kind of button here, and some text here. So this button maybe says OK and this says cancel. Purely hypothetically, you could probably come up with better examples for this. But what we then do with command pattern is that we load these buttons with commands. So maybe we would, lo we would load this OK with an accept command and we would load this cancel with a cancel command. And then both of these would have something like an execute method because both of these are commands. So we have an interface which is called command. And how we could use the null object pattern is by having a no command command. So maybe for some dialog boxes, we don't need the cancel button, but for some absurd reason, it's difficult for us to remove the cancel button. So we can then simply load the cancel button with a no command. Now clearly, if we end up in this situation, maybe we should think about re-architecturing different pieces of the application so we don't end up in this situation. But I'm just taking a sort of hypothetical example just to emphasize that command pattern is also very susceptible to the idea of null objects. And it's very natural to have a no command command. But you could think of it this way. Maybe for some reason we need to disable the cancel button. And instead of then having a switch where we check whether it's disabled or not disabled, we simply use something like a no command that we can load into this button to make it disabled. But again, back to state pattern. Maybe this is more like state patterns. We would say that this button is in a 
non-pressable state. So it is in a disabled state because that would probably give us the possibility to also render this disabledness of the button or essentially render this in so that the user can visually see that it's non-clickable. And hopefully you can see how again the, the null object pattern is actually really powerful because it gives us the ability to handle nothingness in the same way that we handle somethingness. So one of the powers of command pattern is for example that we can do this sort of chaining where you can apply you can stack sort of a command after a command after a command and then execute them but then you keep uh, something like a stack or, or a list of them and then you pop them pop them out in the reverse order which means that you can undo your way back to some particular state so uh, the example I like to bring up all the time is uh, if we think about applications visual applications or imaging processing applications such as uh, Adobe Photoshop for example then maybe this is a blue blurring filter and then another blurring filter and then a sharpening filter. I don't know why you would blur and then sharpen, but you see my point. So you apply, let's say, command number one, command number two, command number three, and command number four. And then you've changed your, if it's an image, for example, that you're working on, you've changed the image from this to, let's say this, and maybe there's a hat and whatever. I mean, and the point is that you've now effectively moved to a new state. You now have a new picture. You've computed a new state, but using command power, Pattern, you can trace your way back. You can undo all the commands backwards back to this original picture. So every action has an has an inverse of itself. So you have so every action has a reverse or has an unaction. Every execute has an unexecute. Every do has an undo. And the reason I'm bringing up that again more about that in the command pattern video. But the reason I'm bringing up that is that if you then use no commands, then you can stack no commands here. If for some reason you need something which which is nullable somewhere along this chain. So let's say here, or even maybe this three, instead of this three being a three, it's, it's a no command. So that means that you don't have to think about when you're, when you're traversing this list or when you're popping off of this stack, you don't have to think about whether a particular command turned out to be null or whether it, so like you don't have to ask yourself the question, do I have a command or don't I have a command? You know that you always have a command because if you don't, you would use the no command command. And that means that whenever you stick your no command into this stack of commands, you can pop it off safely and just treat it as a command because it will definitely have the execute and the unexecute methods or the do and the undo methods. And the same goes for when we use it in state pattern or when we use it in iterator pattern or in completely other contexts. So that's all I wanted to say about the null object pattern. According to Wikipedia, the null object pattern was originally introduced in the book Pattern Languages of Program Design. I haven't read that, so I can't say anything about that book, but I'll link that book in the description if you want to check it out. But that's it for this video. If you have any questions or comments or statements that you want to make, do shoot them in the comments. Also, if you have other examples of when the null object pattern is useful, please do absolutely shoot that in the comments. It'd be really interesting to hear. And if you want to venture down into the rabbit hole, ask yourself this question. Is it not possible to replace every conditional with polymorphism? And isn't it possible to replace every instance of a null with a null object. Now, I don't think that that statement is true, and I think I have good reasons for, for not believing that it's true. But either way, I would say that it's a really interesting idea to think about. Because if we really think about it, in many of the scenarios where we use nulls or conditionals, we could actually, by re-architecturing, replace them with polymorphism. There are a lot of nulls that we can get rid of by instead using the null object pattern and the power of polymorphism. So that's it. Thank you super much for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Wait, also, there is also this great talk by Sandy Metz called Nothing is Something. If you want to know more about the null object pattern, definitely check it out. But now, I'll see you in the next one.